Did we get the live? Karsten? Yes, it's good. We're live now. Thank you, Karsten. Let's see it. Oh, okay. Wait a sec. I think. Good. Okay. So, please. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in our last seminar of the Spring Series 2023. My name is Adriana Maldonado Chaparro, and I'm a professor at Universidad de Rosario in Colombia. I'm one of the co organizers of this seminar and the host for today's seminar. Um, and I'm really happy to have you all here today. Um, before we announce the seminar speaker for this week, um, I would like to first thank our previous speaker, Barbara Cohn, uh, for her awesome talk and discussion on mouse tails, the long road to our integrative understanding of communal breeding in house mice. Um, I will also want to give you some announcements for our season seven. Uh, we already have a great lineup for next seminar series. Uh, we're gonna start with Vanessa Esnevo. And we also will have a special uh, panel about conservation and animal behavior. So keep an eye for the email and the Twitter um, announcing these awesome talks. Um, I'm not sure, probably Carson, do you wanna do any other announcement or are we good to go? No, uh, there's no other announcement. I will put maybe we sh I will also put up this um, preliminary schedule on the YouTube page of Fine quite quite soon, so people can see it there, and we will send emails and everything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So also keep an eye on the YouTube channel. Okay. So um, let's get started. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce this week's um, seminar speaker, Dr. Lauren Brandt. Lauren is an associated professor um, at University of Exeter in the UK. She's been there, or she's been working as a professor since 2020. She received her PhD in evolutionary anthropology in 2022 from the University of Roham Roehampton. Um, and then after that, she did her first postdoc at Duke University and then moved to Exeter um, as a postdoc. But since 2016, she's been a lecturer there. Uh, and then now she's uh, a full professor. Um, Lauren's research focuses on understanding the biology of social behavior. And her group, in general, asks questions about why relationships are formed and how they are maintained. Uh, or why do group living animals differ from in their tendency to interact with others and how deeply embedded are they in their social networks. And overall, she's really active in the social network um, uh, community. So if you have any questions regarding sociality in primates or how to develop methods in social networks, you can also approach her. Um, Lauren has also published in a wide variety of journals um, from all, from a specific to very broad, She's been publishing in Procti, Behavioral Ecology, Methods in Ecology and Evolution. She's very active developing methods, especially for social network. Um, Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, Nature, Science, Animal Behavior, and many other journals. You can check her website and find her work in there. She's also very active in her service. She's an um, active um, and journal editor in Animal Behavior Journal. And of course, she's reserved many awards, honors, and she has a really successful track on securing funding for her research. Um, she's been receiving grants from NSF, NIH, uh, recently ERC, well, not the recently, I think, um, but I think it's like a two year or so, and many other big grants that have helped her fund her research in, um, Cayo Santiago. Um, so for today's seminar, uh, Lauren is going to talk us about the benefits of social connections. And with no further ado, Lauren, please, uh, the mic is all yours. I'm going to stop my share here.
right. Thank you, Adriana. And, and thank you, um, all the organizers for inviting me and, and for putting this, this really fantastic initiative together. Um, Adriana, can you just tell me which version of my slides you're seeing? Is this the presenter view? The correct one. The yeah. correct one. Great. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> All right. Great. So as Adriana says, today I want to talk to you about social connections and their benefits. So us and other animals. Slides are not advancing. Hmm. There we go. Uh, humans and other particularly group living animals uh, associate in many different ways. Um, and they do this in particular if we're thinking along the positive or affiliative or, or co cooperative way uh, in, in a really multifaceted nature. So they can share food, obtain food together. Uh, they can tolerate each other in space and time. They can touch each other physically. They can work together in conflicts. And of course, they exchange uh, affiliated vocalizations or vocalizations more generally. So there's lots of ways that we can cooperate, help, interact in non-agonistic, non-reproductive ways as group living animals. And what's really striking about this is, is not only the diversity of ways that, that we interact. But if you zone in on a group living species and you plot their social network, pretty much universally, what you see is a pattern that looks like this. So these are individuals and the connections that they form between each other. And the first thing you should probably notice is that not everybody interacts with everybody else. And more importantly, perhaps some individuals are better connected to their social networks than others. And I think that's really fundamentally important. Firstly, it's interesting. Why do we see this variation? Why is not everybody universally non-discriminately non connected to everybody else? And secondly, I think it's really important because it provides us fodder to ask questions about the evolution of, of social connections and the consequence variability in how connected individuals are to their social worlds have for those individuals. And indeed, quite a lot of work has asked exactly this question, taken advantage of this variable pattern of integration or isolation and said, well, what consequences does this have for individuals for things linked to biological success, like their mortality? So if you're a person, it seems that being well connected is so beneficial then that it is correlated with reduced mortality risks that are greater than known risk factors like being a heavy smoker, consuming alcohol, being overweight, being exposed to air pollution. And of course, we know and now know that this isn't just true in people, but across a range of group living mammals, individuals who are better connected live longer and have been shown to have greater reproductive output. Which bringing this together suggests that these connections, being well integrated, is adaptive. Right? They've been acted on, on by selection um, because they benefit individuals, which is fascinating. But it then begs the question, well, how, or, or if you like, why? How do social relationships improve the, the health, the survival, the reproductive outcomes, effectively the fitness proxies um, of individuals? And this really remains quite poorly understood. So we're left with an outstanding question, why are social connections linked to fitness proxies? And as Adriana mentioned, this is in fact, one of the main themes of research um, in my group here at Exeter. So uh, through funding from the European Research Council, our friend Origins grant that is yeah, halfway through now, unbelievably, um, and support from places like the National Institutes of Health, I'm very privileged to work with, with a quite large group of postgraduate researchers and postdocs who are asking exactly this question. And we're doing this in actually quite a wide range of systems, for the most part, quite large bodied group living mammals like elephants, mountain gorillas, killer whales, um, 
We're also doing some comparative work that I'll share a little tiny tidbit with of you today across macaque species. We're also doing across uh, mammals some comparative work. We use simulations also when we don't have empirical data and we have certain questions that are more simulation focused. We simulate our networks um, and we have recently launched, launched some uh, social network projects on, on some small mammals with really kind of at first to start with descriptive aims. And also just because I won't have a chance to talk about it in depth today, I did also want to mention the fact that because we deal with social network data and all the wonderful analytical challenges that those type of data pose, we have been also, as Adriana mentioned, uh, working on advancing methods in animal social networks. So work by a PhD student and some collaborators of mine um, has resulted in Bison, Bayesian inference of social networks, which allows us to put uncertainty estimates um, on our social network data. So how integrated is an individual and how certain are we in that value? How dense is a network and how certain are we in that density point estimate? So anyone who's interested, please do check out um, the preprint that I have there. And also it's an R package called Bayesian Bison R. It's not yet um, up on R. You have to download it through, through the GitHub that I've got. Uh, well, that is linked through some of these links. Yes, please do ask me questions about network methods if you've got them. Okay, back to the science. So working on this variety of mammals and systems, some of which for quite a long time we've been working on, um, the opportunity to experience these different contexts, different species in my group has really landed on something that we think is quite fundamental, which is this statement, the function of social connections is not singular or static. Because we often talk about the function of social connections as being singular, that there's, that there's potentially one function, um, or at very least that, it, that it's static. Once we know the function in a certain, in a certain species, population, situation, that that is the function and that's immutable. And this, this in many ways makes sense. This is a relatively new field of exploration, how our social connections uh, evolved and benefit individuals. And so it makes sense to start from a point of, well, let's just assume it's an even playing field. There's one function and that's it. Let's go find out even if it exists. And that's what the work, the state of play of the field has done so far. But I think we're now happily at a point where we've got that under our belts. So let's make our lives a bit more complicated. And let's ask questions about the function of social connections under the assumption that they're dynamic, that they're flexible, that they're multifaceted. Because connections, we assume, are used by animals as tools, right, to cope with challenges that they face in their environments. And of course, the challenges that animals face aren't singular, and they're certainly not static. So, uh, and furthermore, an individual's ability to respond to those challenges might just depend on who they are in that, in that given moment, um, what resources they have available to them. And they might depend on what context that individual finds itself in uh, on a group or population level. So, so I think it's kind of, perhaps even obvious that uh, given all this variability that we sort of have hints of that we should pull together on the idea that the function of social connections is dynamic, flexible, and respond to what challenges animals face, who those animals are, and when they're facing those channel challenges. So to explain a bit more what I mean, let's go through each of these, the who, the what, and the when function of social connections. So what, quite simply, is, well, what challenges does the animal that we're interested in face? Do you need a hammer or a screwdriver to solve that challenge? Which one do you choose? So you might be a species that faces a lot of interspecific conflict, and you might need to solve that socially. You might be a cooperative hunter. You might need access to particular spatial resources or tolerance in your environment that allows you to access food. Uh, you might need information or directly, you might need to obtain food from others in your environment. 
You might be a species that faces thermoregulatory challenges. You might need to solve those socially. Uh, or you might be a species that's faced with um, high levels of communicable diseases. And one way you might face you might face those challenges is through social means. So do you need a tool? Do you need a hammer or a screwdriver? But as I said, your ability to face those challenges probably also depends on who you are. Who you are as a species is a very obvious one, but we can also think about developmental trajectories and aging is an old individual facing the same challenges as a younger member of its same population or group. Are males and females facing similar challenges and able to solve them in, in similar ways? And who are your partners? Who are you interacting with? Are they kin? Or are they not kin? Um, and finally, when animals are facing those challenges also matters in the function of social connections. Are they living in a particularly seasonal habitat? Is that a predictable level of seasonality? As their population grows, um, what's happening to their need to access social connections in those scenarios? And what happens when massive unexpected perturbations occur in these systems? So today I wanna to impress upon you that if we're interested in detecting the function of social connections, we really need to embrace this multifaceted and dynamic nature and to start to tease apart the who, the what, and the when of the function of social connections. So to begin to start to convince you of the dynamic and flexible nature of the function of social connections, I'm going to start by talking about, well, what evidence do we have that the function of social connections um, is indeed not static nor singular? And I want to do that by talking about the fact that, well, first and foremost, there are lots of ways of being so-called well-connected, right? There's not a single way of being well-connected to your social world. You can have, for example, what I'm gonna call quality relationships. So these might be what we might classically refer to as friendships if we're people or social bonds for non-human animals. Those real fitness interdependency, solid, stable, frequent, frequently interacting relationships. You can also be well connected by simply having a lot of social partners. It doesn't really necessarily matter who those individuals are, you just have a lot of them. You might also be what I'm going to call structurally well connected. So you might, in kind of human terms, have a lot of friends of friends. So you're well connected to your network through your partner's connections with others. And finally, you might be well connected in a really simple way that I'm going to call directly connected. Whatever the behavior it is you need to do, grooming, for example, you might simply do a lot of it. Who you're doing it with doesn't matter but you are just engaging in the behavior that you need often. So you're directly well connected. And I think it's quite reasonable to assume or hypothesize that these different types of connections, given their different characteristics, types of partners, frequency, are able to serve different functions, right? They're able to be that hammer or that screwdriver that these different types of connections are the solution to dips different types of challenges. And so we might hypothesize, for example, that these social bonds, these fitness interdependencies, where you invest a lot in another and in another individual um, function to allow you to solve really high risk uh, challenges. So these are your alliance partners. These are the individuals that help you in a conflict. If you have a lot of a lot of partners, if you go for quantity, then we might hypothesize that what you need from your social partners is, is more general tolerance. You need to be able to move around in space and time in your environment with very little encumbered. In, little encumbered. <laughs> if you're structurally well connected, there's been a lot of work on this in network science that those measures of sort of friend of friend structural connectedness uh, have ties to information flow. So if you're the type of individual or species indeed that needs to obtain information, then being structurally well-connected is probably a sensible route to be the first individual to receive information 
or for information to flow quickly through your social network. And then finally, if you're the type of species that faces a lot of communicable diseases, you might need to groom each other a lot. So you might need to engage a lot in whatever behavior it is that you need to engage in. So if the function of social connections is in particularly singular, let's leave static to the side for one moment now, then we might expect individuals to form a single type of connection only at a species level. And of course we know that, that they don't. These animals engage in different types of interactions um, with their conspecifics. But then within a species, we might say, well, if the function of social connections is singular, then we should expect really only one type of social connection to be associated with fitness in that species. So if we look back at this literature review and we plot what types of social connections have been associated with survival in this case, we find some um, survival is correlated with quality connections. In some species is correlated with having a large quantity of connections. And in addition, some of those um, have found evidence for structural connections having um, a correlation with survival. So this is starting to suggest perhaps that within a species, it's not all about a single type of connection and then potentially not all about a single function of those connections. However, this is a tiny bit of a garden path I've led you up, mostly because most of these studies have only evaluated a single way of being well connected. So they can't really compare across the different ways. Um, and also often these measures of connectedness are, are, are can be quite intercorrelated. So it's just something we need to account for or at least acknowledge if we're going to go down this garden path. So to do this a little bit more explicitly, this is something that we set out to look at in my research group. And we asked ourselves, well, what if we do take a simple, single system and genuinely compare the fitness correlates of different types of connections? And we're gonna do that in this data point, um, the rhesus macaque. So a lot of my research takes place here on Cayo Santiago Island, which is a small island off the coast of Puerto Rico, which is a free ranging site that's home to about 1500 rhesus macaques you see we're running around through the screen here. So these animals are provisioned um, and they have no predators, but they're otherwise left to their own devices. So they form groups with who they want, they mate with who they want, uh, they disperse among, among groups, what these males do, which is exactly uh, what rhesus macaques, who are native to Asia from India all the way through to China, do in the wild. So, these are a highly gregarious species. They're group living. They live in large groups um, that are a combination of adult males and adult females. They're matrilineally structured. So females live with their close relatives, but they also often live with unrelated matrilines. And they're classically thought of as being um, highly despotic, the females. So they're very steep dominance hierarchies. Females inherit their rank from their mothers and they keep that consistently throughout their lifetime. So there's lots of conflict that goes on between and also within rhesus macaque groups, but there are also very high levels of affiliation. So this species can spend upwards of 20% of their daytime waking hours engaged in things like grooming behavior. The Coyote Santiago Field Station is um, a really important resource for the scientific community. So this is one of the longest running um, field sites in the world. It was founded in 1938 um, with a founding population of 400 that were brought over from India and released onto the island and their descendants have remained there ever since. So there's no, been no introduction of new animals since that point, um, which means that we have a really deep demographic database going back to 1956. I can trace the um, relatedness along maternal lines at very least. And then we have a genetic pedigree that dates back to 1992. So there's census takers on the island who also every five days of the week basically record census data. So we know um, within precision of about a week how long these animals are living. So their date of birth and their dates of death. 
So it's a really fantastic, um, deeply phenotyped system. If we go back to our different types of social relationships, then rhesus macaques kind of fit the bill because if they're forming, well, we know that they need uh, or they use alliances when they're faced off with other rhesus macaques. They might need tolerance in their environment. They might need um, to pick up information from others. And given the fact they groom a lot, they might need some hygienic benefits from their social relationships. So in addition to the long-term data on Kyo that is accessible to anyone who works there, my group also collect um, detailed behavioral data on these animals. So this is one of my research assistants, Josue Negron, and he's collecting a focal animal sample um, on an individual called 63V, who he recognizes this based purely on sight. And he's asking, well, what is she doing in this given moment? Is she interacting with anyone? Um, no, not particularly. However, one of our adult males, 43P, is within two meters of her. We would record that as being in proximity. What is she actually doing? Well, she's eating dirt at the moment. Um, and he would repeat this process across all adults in a given social group, um, balancing across days and uh, months of the year, paying in particular in attention to not just proximity, also agonistic interactions, as well as things like grooming behavior. So we've been doing that process since uh, 2010 across seven different social groups on the island, um, varying in terms of how much effort we've put into any single group over the years, but have amassed uh, social data on over 830 individuals to date across those groups. And we use our social data largely to map the social networks of these individuals that you see here. So these are different groups um, based on their colors across time. And you can see just like that network I showed you at the outset, some individuals are very clearly better connected than others. So if we merge our lovely social network data with our survival data that we have on Cayo Santiago, Oh, but first I'm gonna tell you how we might actually quantify these different types of social connections. Um, so this is work by a former postdoc of mine, Sam Ellis. Sam and I sat down and said, okay, well, how might we use our data and say, what's a quality relationship? So we took our social networks and this is a cartoon example where the individual in the middle is the one that we care about. And we said, okay, well, if we're interested in strong connections, let's set a threshold for what a high quality connection might be and then tally up for example how many strong connections an individual has so that's what this this green network is showing you this individual has one two three strong connections if we're interested in the quantity of quantity of relationships that an individual might have well then we're just going to tally up all of their relationships, all of the connections that they have with all others. So now we've got one, two, three, four. These are very simplistic versions of what we did. Um, there's quite a lot more detail in how we quantify these networks, but I didn't want to get too nitty gritty for the purposes of today. If we're interested in structural connectedness, this is an example of a network measure called betweenness, um, which takes into account an individual's position in the network relative to the role they play connecting disparate, disparate parts of the network to each other. So we can compute things like that. And then if we're interested in just, well, how often are you engaged in a particular behavior? Let's say these edges are now grooming. Well, then we would just tally up the rate at which you engage in grooming. We can merge that then with our lovely survival data. And we can ask, well, which ones of these are correlated with survival outcomes? And we found find some of our measures of having quality connections and some of our measures of having a high quantity of connections were correlated with survival, whereas neither being indirectly or structurally connected or directly connected had any indication that they were influencing survival in this system. So rhesus macaques might be using their social relationships to do things like form alliances against others, or to obtain tolerance in their social environment, they might not be using their connections to obtain information or for hygienic function. But more to the point, I think this is nice 
preliminary evidence that, of course, the function of social connections, even within a single species, in a single population, in a relatively stable environmental period in their lives, um, is not singular, right? They're, they're potentially, because importantly, females that were well connected in one way were not the same females that were well connected in the other, right? So this is suggesting that there's some dynamics to the system. Some individuals are using their social relationships to solve some problems, others are using them to solve a different problem. So preliminary pointing towards the function of social connections not being singular nor static. Let's drill down now a little bit more into, well, what problem are social relationships helping us to solve? <clears throat> what evidence is there that the interactions that individuals form in groups serve a specific function? Um, of course, there's some really classic examples out there. Alliances and dolphins help you obtain mating opportunities, uh, thermoregulatory benefits uh, in some primates and some rodents. There's some evidence that has come out of my research group about information transfer. So these are two species that are faced with challenges in terms of obtaining ephemeral resources. So if you're an elephant, the, low, the timing of watering, water being available at water holes can vary, can be quite unpredictable. If you're a killer whale, salmon can vary greatly both in space and time. And we've shown that older individuals um, and your connections to them are potentially leading uh, younger individuals to those resources. But what I want to impress upon you is that these are fantastic examples of potential benefits of social connections, but it's really difficult often for us to then take that next step and demonstrate, and there are potential fitness consequences to that function. So I want to share with you a case study uh, where we've been able to do just that, to explore the function of social connections and tie it to a fitness proxy. And that specific case study has to do with injury. So being injured is, a, of course, a key challenge lots of animals face. They get injured by their predators. They sometimes get injured by the environment and they get injured by conspecifics. And of course, injury, uh, we assume, uh, negatively impacts survival. Sociality, as we've talk, been talking about, has putative links to survival outcomes. How might sociality modulate survival in the context of injury? There are two ways it might do this. Once you're injured, sociality might influence whether or not you survive that injury. It can do that by hygienic functions, right? Your social partners might help you recover from that injury. But sociality can, might also modulate whether you get injured in the first place, your risk of injury. They can do that through these, these alliances um, and coalition partners. So this is work from a PhD student of mine, Melissa Pevez Fox, who delved into this question in our rhesus macaque system. So asking whether alliances or social partners in rhesus macaques um, modulate your risk of injury or your survival once you're injured. And she did this using a database that she actually generated, well, digitized, that was sitting just in a file drawer. Um, she pulled out over 500 animals, classified as whether they were injured or not, that you see here in plots A and B. And then asked first very simply, are you more likely to die if you're injured versus not being injured? And found indeed injured individuals were three times more likely to die in the ensuing two months after their injury than animals that were not injured. So injury can impact your survival. Can sociality modulate that? First, she looked at how many affiliative partners an individual has in a group and found that sociality did indeed appear to modulate the risk of being injured in the first place. So evidence for that yellow arrow there. However, injured individuals didn't have, a, with a lot of social partners, didn't have a different risk of dying. This air, red slope isn't different from this gray slope, suggesting that the hygienic function hypothesis um, doesn't have any evidence to support it. Now, if we summarize our results in a dy dyadic acrylic graph, we see here social capital is influencing your probability of it being injured. 
which influences your survival risk. Social capital also continues to have uh, an influence on survival that we haven't explained in the system, again, pointing to there being multiple functions of social connections. Um, and there are some other confounding factors that were taken into account. And just to quickly mention this risk of injury and your social connections, we've also um, repeated this in the killer whale system where we've shown that males in particular, when they are in a group with their old, older post-reproductive mother, who is their closest associate, also um, appear to be less injured than males whose post-reproductive mother has died. So continuing on a theme of the challenges that some animals face, injury, surviving from it and avoiding it in the first place um, is potentially a putative function of our social connections. So I wanna switch over to then who we are as individuals and how does that modulate uh, potentially our what challenges we face and how we're using our social connections to solve them. And in particular, I want to look at um, the phenomenon of aging, because understanding the functional drivers of social behavior is really fundamentally tied to our understanding of how social behavior changes across our lifespan. And this has been the focus of one of my postdocs, Erin Syracuse, in her time uh, in my group. She's got this really lovely paper that goes through the three um, possible drivers of changes in behavior and social behavior in mammals in later life with a nice uh, series of predictions. But I wanna focus in on the adaptive responses for the purposes of today. Um, and this idea in particular of social selectivity. So it's been posited that older individuals, well, as individuals age, that they shrink their social networks because the costs of, of large networks become too high, for example, health costs, you become in, immunocompromised in old age, and so the costs of engaging with others go up. And potentially the benefits of connections are different in old age, what you need from others shifts. And this has been shown um, in humans. And Aaron wanted to ask, well, as non-humans are aging, can we also detect this? So she again looked at this in our rhesus macaque system. And the predictions of social selectivity, I should say, are really about who you're engaging with. So you continue to input social effort and to receive social input from others. So you're still engaged in your social world as much as you were when you were younger, but who you're in interacting with changes. So you have fewer social partners. So what did Erin find? Well, she used um, our long-term data in the rhesus macaques seen here. Each individual is a row um, and their ages are plotted along the X axis. And using a within individual age centering approach, she showed, for example, that the as an individual was getting older, its number of grooming partners changed, its number of par proximity partners changed, demonstrating that indeed networks were shrinking. However, animals were still approaching others and giving grooming to others. They were still being approached and receiving grooming from others. So support across the board for the main predictions of social selectivity. And in particular, also as we would predict, who these animals were focusing on was close kin, their previously strong partners and some stable partners that they have. All of which points to the costs and benefits of social connections shifting as individuals age, right? They're not static. Um, these animals are responding to their own personal circumstances, aging and changing what they do with their social connections. And actually, if we think back to a paper I published as a research fellow, um, this seems to actually be going on in terms of survival outcomes, where here well-connected individuals have higher social survival outcomes than poorly connected ones until they hit actually about the <clears throat> roughly the median age of death in this system for these females, um, which is better seen here over on the beta plot, which is about 18, where suddenly the mortality hazard shifts into positive and the consequences of being well connected dissipate in terms of survival. So survival is no longer associated with being well connected for these older age female rhesus macaques. If we're 
thinking about who we also need to mention cross species comparisons. So just very quickly, I want to mention the work of another postdoc in my group, Delphine Damour, who has built this lovely grassroots global collaboration called MacaqueNet. So macaque researchers across the world have contributed data to this. It's under fair science principles. So anyone wishing to ask questions about social networks in the genera macaca, which has 25 species, and in MacaqueNet, we've got 14 or 15 species, their social networks um, available in there for researchers to request for research projects. What we're going to do is ask questions about, well, what challenges do these different species face? Um, and does that is that recapitulated in the structure of their social networks? Okay, so the function of social connections depends on the challenges you face, who you are as an individual or as a species. What about what context you find yourself in particular? Just to finish, I wanna end with a large perturbation that my field site in Puerto Rico experienced five years ago, which is Hurricane Maria. Um, so this is a category four hurricane, which is the most damaging on record in the history of Puerto Rico. Thousands of people lost their lives. The field station was out without power for nine months. And there's widespread damage to Cayo Santiago. So this is an aerial shot of the island before Maria. This is what it looked like three days afterwards. All the research infrastructure was destroyed. Trees fell, um, really widespread destruction. We look at this from a satellite view. We have seven months here before Maria. There are lush mangroves all along the top edge of the island and just forested areas throughout. Two weeks after Maria, um, you can start to see the devastation to the trees. And five years on, many of those trees have now completely disappeared. They were already dead and now they're completely gone. And if we look at a green air index taken from satellite images, the drop in vegetation following Maria was 63%. And it's been slowly creeping up, although most of this is grasses, it's not trees. Um, so this is a bit of a misnomer, but regardless, it's nowhere near the levels of greenness that the island was before Maria. And it's hotter, it's on average um, seven degrees hotter in the areas that are now exposed to the full sun than the areas that have the benefit of whatever remaining shade there is. Somehow, however, mortality was really low immediately following the storm. So this little blip in orange here represents about the, the about 50 animals that died in the month following Hurricane Maria, and then mortality rates basically returned to baseline following that. So, what I want to share with you is to say, well, in the face of environmental, massive environmental upheaval that has persisted, um, do the adaptive benefits of social connections shift along with those changes? So shade in particular um, is a really scarce resource. You would never see monkeys lined up in a spot of shade like this before Maria, and now it's a very common um, sighting. They even use me as shade. And we know that primates and their close relatives, the rodents, use social thermoregulation as a response to cold in particular, um, but also potentially as a response to heat stress. So this is work by a PhD student who I work with, who's based at the University of Pennsylvania, Camille Testag. And Camille showed that one year after Maria, um, that the monkey's behaviors, monkey's behavior did indeed change, in particular they were much more likely to be found in proximity to other animals after Maria. So these are two social groups, KK and V, and we see a 400% increase in the probability that a given individual is found sitting next to somebody else after the storm compared to before. What were they doing in terms of the types of relationships they were forming? Were they increasing the quality of their relationships? Were they just spending loads and loads of time with their particular preferred partners? Or were they increasing how many partners, the quality quantity of partners they had in their networks? So this is a, an example network um, of proximity. Oh, it's actually grooming. The story still holds when we talk about proximity, apologies. Um, before Maria and afterwards, it's very clearly the case that the number of connections has gone up and actually the quality of connections went down, whether we consider grooming 
um, but in particular when we consider sitting next to others. And we hypothesized, just like in that picture I showed you of the monkeys, that what was going on here is that shade is now a really scarce resource and it's hot. And what helps you get access to shade is not necessarily having really a small number of really close social connections because that individual might not have access to shade. So if you walk into a busy bar and you've got one close friend there and the table they're sitting at is already full, well, that doesn't really help you. But if you have a huge number of social connections, you know a lot of people in this bar, the chances are that you find a seat that you get to sit down are just much higher. And we think this is what's going on in the animals on Cayo Santiago. Has this persisted given the environmental damage, you know, that might have been an acute response, but the environmental damage has persisted. It's still hotter on Cayo um, today than it was five years ago. So we use our long-term data now to ask, um, what's happening over time. So here's the original result I just showed you. Proximity in 2018 was much more likely than in any of the years before. And that's still true in 2019. 2020, we didn't collect any data because of COVID. 2021 and 2022, the networks are just denser. These animals are just spending more time in proximity with a large number of other individuals. We summarize this. So the, the strength in kind of networky jargon relative to pre-hurricane, which is this line here, we see in every year since Maria, proximity levels are up and actually aggression levels are also down, right? So this is suggesting enhanced tolerance in this system um, across the board. But does it matter? Does it actually matter? Is this an adaptive response these animals are engaging in? And has the benefits of interacting with others shifted um, now that we've had this massive environmental upheaval? So we looked at the effect of being well integrated when it comes to having proximity partners um, before the hurricane. And I've actually already shown you this result, but just to show it to you again, there's no relationship between sitting next to others often um, and survival before Maria. And after Maria, there very clearly is that association. So after Maria, being well-connected, particularly with respect to having a lot of partners who you spend a lot of time sitting next to um, is correlated with mortality outcomes. So the function of social connections, I hope I've convinced you is not singular or static. Connections help individuals to solve the challenges that they face in their environments. And those challenges, of course, vary across species, can also vary, however, within a species. Who they are in that moment in time can determine their ability to respond to those challenges and also the challenges they face in the first place. And massive perturbations, knocks to the system can alter what we need out of our social relationships and therefore as a consequence alter the social structure that we see in the animals that we study. So social connections are adapted for group living animals. Being well connected provides you with benefits. But the function of social connections is something that we need to consider as being dynamic, flexible, context dependent. In other words, it's quite complicated but this variation and this dynamism, I think, is really fantastic fodder. And by asking who, what, and when, we'll really be able to take that next step from going beyond saying well, social connections are adaptive, hooray, to, and their function is this. But more specifically, their functions are this. So with that, I just want to thank everyone um, here at Exeter, particularly in my research group, everyone at the Cayo Santiago Field Station and my colleagues at the Cayo Biobank Research Unit um, and all of my funders. If anyone wants to check out the MacaqueNet website, I put it up there. Um, and my Twitter handle is also up at the top. And then finally, thank you again to the organizers for inviting me and putting this fantastic seminar series together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lauren, for a great talk. Um, 
it was really interesting. Thank you for answering. And then I will just type in here. Um, and as I open the discussion session, um, so please, I just remind everyone, please type in a question mark on the chat. Um, and then I called you uh, by your name. Please make sure to introduce yourself uh, as we're trying to build a community and get to know each other. And then people on YouTube, uh, please type in your questions in the YouTube channel. Um, Carson will be uh, checking on the YouTube and he relayed the questions to um, our speaker today, Lauren. Okay, so we've already got some questions here in the, in the chat. Michael? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting. Uh, Michael Toborski from the University of Bern. Um, what I would like to know is, um, of course, some of these relationships between uh, connectedness and uh, fitness measures like survival and productivity or so uh, seem very plausible. But the, the question is uh, whether they're really causal. Uh, of course, they, they, they could be some correlate. So they could be a measure of uh, some traits that these particularly successful animals have, uh, but it is not really the cause of their success. So my question is, are there any experimental approaches uh, that really show that it is connectedness that is important and not uh, the fact that this correlates with uh, some other uh, abilities of the individuals involved. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And nice, nice to see you. Thanks for coming along. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And uh, that's a question that has been, I think, quite widely recognized in the field as something that hasn't been fully resolved and where really a lot of work needs to go, needs to go next. Um, I would argue in a way that our hurricane example is a natural experiment that gets at that because individuals who um, were doing one thing in a certain situation, there wasn't this correlation. Suddenly the, the situation has changed, they've changed their behavior and their outcomes have changed. So I would I would argue that that that, that is a naturalistic experiment. So you know the messiness of, of nature is still there, but an experiment that hints at causality, nonetheless. Um, and I would also encourage people to consider age and aging as a natural experiment in which to play with these questions as well, because as individuals are changing and their needs change and their abilities change, this is also a natural course of variation where we can track within individuals what they're doing and how that shifts in response to their changing bodies and changing environments. So I would point that, and a lot of people are looking towards social aging as indeed a playground to ask those, those types of questions. Full blown lab experiments, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a blank. It doesn't mean that they, they don't exist, um, but it, right now I'm drawing a blank for a good example that pops straight into my head for a full-blown laboratory experiment where you can really like knock causality on the head. Um, I'm sure if somebody else in the audience has got one to mind, they'll, they'll chime in. But I think yeah. there are some nice natural experimental scenarios that arise in a lot of the systems that we're working on um, that will let us start to get at this causality because I do agree with you that it is fundamentally a question that we need to that we need to answer. May, may I just uh, very briefly uh, comment on your response? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Of course, I also thought, well, this uh, this uh, terrible hurricane was this kind of naturalistic experiment, but probably, I'm not sure, but probably it did not really change the connectedness of individuals. It just changed the importance of the connectedness, but it did not sort of uh, manipulate the uh, connections in a, in a specific way. I'm not sure whether this is true, but, and, and one, other, one other comment to your um, plea for looking at age as a, as a kind of experimental situation. I, I fully agree with that. And 
And I think the data that you showed that in, in the females until the age of 18, I think it was or so, connectedness uh, correlated positively with survival probability apparently, but then the lines crossed, it seemed at least. Yeah. What, what is the reason for crossing the lines? I mean, that. do, do you have any, any hint on that? Well, so the boring mathematical reason is that hazards aren't proportional. So the, the hazard, the mortality hazard was below zero. So suggesting survival benefits before they reached 18, and then it flips to be positive. The sample, this is always the problem with aging data. We have very few old individuals. So I wouldn't like to say that suddenly that actually having social connections is, is the worst outcome. I think we can just say there's no longer evidence that being well connected when you're a very old female rhesus macaque is correlated with survival anymore as as far as we can push it. Mm. Why actually, it's easier for me to identify the costs of being old and socializing than it is for me to identify necessarily why the why what you need from your social partners might have might have shifted with age. And the cost, of course, the obvious one is is that, you know, as we age, we're less able to deal with communicable diseases. Our immune systems don't function as well. We might wish to avoid interacting with a large number of others, focus in on repeated partners um, so that our exposure to a diversity of pathogens is at least a little bit consistent and potentially less frequent. What you're doing in your social life with old with old age and what the benefits of your social connections might be, I think are my ideas are certainly less well formed on that front, but it's something that we're going to continue to to push forward and and to to explore. But it's less obvious to me why mm -hmm. suddenly you, you need something different from your social partners or you need nothing from your social partners. Um, you know, we could talk about enhanced experience with age. So you don't need others as much to solve you solving the solutions yourself, right? Personal information versus social information. You know, we can put that forward maybe, but um, I think there are probably some less exciting kind of confounds or correlates lurking in the system that are, yeah, might actually be what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have a question from Raghavendra. Uh, Yes, thank you. This was fascinating. Uh, do you know, both in general and in your system in particular, how sitting next to another individual might help you to live longer? Yeah. <clears throat> so in our system, after the hurricane, when thermoregulation and heat stress um, are harder problems to solve, we think sitting next to another individual is simply an indication, well, it allows you to access shade, right? So it's an indication that you're accessing shade, there's not much shade around, so you need to do that socially. So you need to be sitting next to others in order to be in the shade. Um, and so if you're able to do that more often, you're less likely to face what can be really physiologically detrimental um, impacts of extreme heat on an individual. So I think if you repeat that over time, you're sitting in the shade or you're not, that prolonged exposure to extreme temperatures um, can absolutely kill you. <laughs> Just a clarification. Yeah. Is it, is it sitting in the shade of another individual or simply co-sitting in the shade? Co-sitting in the shade. Co-sitting in the shade. They sit in, they sit in my shade, but they themselves are not tall enough to provide shade for each other. So, so you're co-sitting under under like a big lush tree, yeah. and the big but lush trees just, are really it's the shade and not the sitting next to another individual that really is crucial. What's really crucial is sitting in the shade. Yes, when there's much less shade available, you're you're on a quite densely populated island. Sitting next to somebody else is a requirement for sitting in the shade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, how you access the shade is you tolerate. You receive tolerance, you give tolerance, you allow others to sit near you, they allow you them to sit near them. Mm -hmm. If they didn't do that, um, then yeah, very few animals would actually have access to shade. And I think we would see much higher mortality rates on the island than we have been seeing. Yeah, yeah, sorry that that wasn't clear. Yes, it's co-sitting 
under a big shady tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Raghavendra. Um, we have two questions from the YouTube. Karsten? Yes, hello, I'm Carsten Schrading, researcher at the CNRS in France and co-organizer of Define. So I bring two questions from YouTube and I start with the one that connects more directly to the question Rush just had. And um, oh, there's the chat. Marta, Monza, Mo, Marta Mosner asks, regarding the hurricane study, do individuals have more connections to have more chance of sitting in the shade? Or do they indict more because there's little space in the shade forcing proximity? So what, what caused this what, if I understand this right? Can you repeat again the two examples, Kirsten, just so I make sure that I have them? So do they interact more so they have more shade or because there's little shade and they all want the shade, they're forced to have close proximity and that forces them to interact more? Yeah. Um... We don't know is the short answer because we don't have the temporal resolution to our data to be able to say what came before what. I think potentially those aren't mutually exclusive. Both might be happening concurrently. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't tell you directly because we, we just can't drill down into our data to say, well, this happens and then as a consequence that happens or vice versa. Okay, and then there's a second question by um, Phyllis Lee. Thanks so much for the amazing overview. If learned or uh, if learned early experience sets standards for later behavior, age difference over time won't take this into account. How to tease this out? Mm -hmm. um, I don't fully understand it. Maybe I didn't pay enough attention to your talk. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, first of all, hi, Phyllis. Thanks for the question. I'm um, it in the chat here. Okay. So yeah, let's see if I can if I can work it out. If learned oh, and, and embody Phyllis for a second here. So there's early life learning and development, and that sets you up on a certain trajectory. I think is what the first part is saying. And then aging in adulthood won't be able to do anything about that. Is that, is that where we're going? Probably yes. <laughs> Probably yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, oh, well. I would say, I mean, I would say it's an interesting question. I think it's probably an outstanding question. I'm not sure that I would think theoretically in one way or the other that you're necessarily locked in from your early life experiences to yeah, that the rest of your developmental life course wouldn't then also play a role. But I think probably behind the question, it's like if, you have your early life experience, you're set into some sort of, I will be like super social, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then your life experiences changes over time. And then you become less sociable, but not mm. so much that you can actually tell if you're less sociable because of your life experiences uh, later on or because you were set to be like super social before i think that's what it's mm. getting at how to tease these two things apart so the way that we've done it in the rhesus macaque system is really key because we have within individual data right so we're not comparing young individuals to old individuals we're comparing a single female to herself as she ages so her starting point she's a really social female she's a really asocial female doesn't matter because all we're saying is, where does she go from there? If she starts off social, is she becoming less social? She might still be more social than some of her conspecifics because she started off really high. And if you start off really asocial, you might not have much room to go down, but we found that they are still going down. So if you've got within individual data across the life course, then these between individual differences not that they don't matter, but you're able to ask questions about, well, given an individual's current state at age X, what does she do in the next year? And what does she do in the next year? And what does she do in the next year? 
So even though early life might set up some individuals or, you know, their genes or how their brain is structured or whatever it is set up individuals to be here and other individuals to be here in terms of how social they are, they could still go up or down in terms of their levels of sociality as they individually are aging. So I think that's the key as we're asking questions about life courses and social behavior. We need to both ask questions, how do young individuals differ from old ones? How do infants differ, differ from juveniles? But we also need to say, as an individual is going through those developmental stages and then senescing, what's happening to their behavior? I think we got there. Phyllis will tell me later if I got it completely wrong, I'm sure. We hope so, and you let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carson, for relaying the questions. Um, I think I'm next. Um, and my question relates to the hurricane scenario. Um, because, so if I understand correctly, it's co-sitting in the shade, right? Um, but then you'll have individuals that are co-sitting in the shade as well as individuals that are co-sitting um, exposed to sun, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and what I'm thinking here is, have you tested if there is any difference in survival between co-sitting in the shade or the ones who co-sit more or co sat more in the shade versus the ones that co sat more in the non-shaded areas or exposed yeah. to sun. And so maybe they'll tease apart a little bit the, cons the spatial constraint that makes them be more tolerant somehow, right? Because there is, you know, the, the spatial structure also influences the social structure. Because if you don't have anywhere else to see it, then you have to see it with someone. And yeah. probably you will see it with someone you like rather than someone that you don't like. But then if it's that, what is changing? And probably that will give us better understanding of what drives or what correlates with survival. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, I think we have, but we've done it in an indirect way because we don't have data about the current thermo situation within our focal animal follows. So we don't know where an animal is sitting when we're recording a proximity data point. So the way that we've done this indirectly is to say, is to compare morning and afternoon, right? So it's hotter, much hotter in the afternoon than it is in the morning. Individuals are much more likely to be found in proximity to others in the afternoon than they are in the morning. And that survival result that we found following the hurricane is stronger in the afternoon than in the morning. So if you well connected in terms of sitting next to others in the morning, eh, that's okay with respect to uh, your mortality risk, but it's really borne out by those afternoon data points when it's really hot. If you're well connected in the afternoon when it's the hottest, um, then your mortality hazard is is the lowest. So it doesn't exactly get at it using where were you sitting, who were you sitting next to, um, was it really sunny there or not, but I think it indirectly gets at the point. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question from Kirsten. Yes, I come with my own question. First, thanks a lot for this really fascinating talk, this comprehensive story from theory to this case study with the macaques. And I have to apologize for my cognitive um, limitations. Probably if I would listen to your talk again, I would get the answer. And I'm also like often happens with humans cognitively blocked and I have my worldview and then I try to put these things in. <laughs> now, um, you had this um, slide about um, the social, these interactions, who, what, and when. And for my worldview, the, the what, is very important where you brought example, if it's a number of, of connections, number of strong connections of what they're actually doing. And from my point of view, the, what they are actually doing is the most important thing because for me, social interactions consist sometimes of cooperation, but most often of exploit, exploitation and trying not to be exploited 
um, by others. And so individuals can have a lot of connections because they exploit all the individuals around themselves or because they avoid these exploitations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether this plays a role, for example, when one looks at your figure with the survival probability in the macaques, the well-connected have a higher probability, but only very small. And maybe these are actually two groups of macaques, ones that are well-connected and exploit others and thus have a big advantage, and the other ones who get exploited and have a small advantage. And that makes the difference less strong than if one would look in more detail what they're actually doing or how these connections come into existence. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um... Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with you. Well, firstly, I agree with you that the what question is really the big question and the rest of it is is just a way for us, us to narrow down the what question. So absolutely. And, and dealing with, with, well, exploiting versus being exploited, or I would say effectively dealing with intergroup conflict, the costs of living with others, um, I, I, to me, is one of the main drivers of social connections. It's the solution to that problem. How do you solve the problem that you live with others? You're competing with them. They want to exploit you. Uh, they want to harm you. They want to have the resources and block you from having the resources. Well, you form alliances, right? You have coalition partners. You have others in your group where you have a different relationship from those, those who wish to exploit you. You have your fitness dependent others who are working together to avoid that and potentially jointly exploit those exploiters, right? So I think exactly this, that, that the relationships we form within our groups are a response to that tension on being exploited. I want to exploit. It's, it's easier. There are ways to do that uh, that are more effective if I'm doing it in a team than if I'm doing it on my own. And that's, that's one of the questions that we like to ask in the MacaqueNet comparison. I didn't get into the power of macaques. Not only do we know a lot about their social lives in you know, a number of species that, at least within primates, is, is unparalleled. And, and people have very kindly said, yeah, let's everyone use these data that we've amassed over decades across these species. Um, but also, that's a fundamental thing that varies, the level of competition. In, across macaque species varies quite a lot. So one of the things that we, one of the first things we want to ask is, well, does that relate to their affiliative social structure? Are the ones that are really competitive, forming really strong relationships, heavy duty alliances, and the ones that are less competitive, a bit more laissez-faire, a bit more quantity, weak relationships, kind of flavor of macaques. Okay, thank you. And if I might have a short follow-up question um, to um, connect to our long-term discussion of significance and data. On your slide, where you then showed the four different um, possibilities and related to survival, you said the, the first one, co um, corporations, is significant, and the second one is how, how many, and the two others not, but the graphs yeah. look, look very, very similar to me. I mean, even if there's a, a p, the p-value differs, but the the number of um i think uh, of supportive associations and survival if even if it's not significant i mean the, the the line looks great or not or did i misunderstand this um so i go by I'm talking about this here yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Looks, for me i would be happy to get graphs like that Oh yeah, no, it was <laughs> in the pink one, the two lines, well-connected, not well-connected, fully overlap. So there's no uh, difference there. And with you, with the yellow one, there's a bit of separation between the dark yellow, which is the well-connected and the poorly connected ones that are paler yellow, which I actually now realize I didn't explain my graphs. Oh, okay, now I understand. So there's, so there's like a little there's sliver between groups. those two. Are there yeah. uh, oh, okay, okay, so then just, I, I uh, yeah. understand the graph. So even though I don't understand survival plots either when I first look at them, so should know okay. to explain them to people when I'm presenting them. Oh, so it's, it's I didn't explain to you that yeah, well connected are the dark is the darker line, poorly connected okay. is the lighter line. So that the white space in between them indicates, you know, the the size of the difference between those two groups. And of course, this is only for visualizations, you know, we use continuous data anyway. Um and yeah, the pink one and the yellow one, there's either no gap between those two groups or it's very small. And it's a bit bigger, not massively bigger, because these effects are small, as most social effects are. Um, but 
statistically important. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that was that was on me for zooming through my stuff too quickly. Thank you, Carson. Um, and we have another question from Clara. I'm Clara B. Jones, uh, retired social evolution. I uh, this was a fascinating talk. Thank you for all your work. I just have a comment on your result that with age, um, partners decrease, partner number decreases, and and combined with that the result that aggression decreases after the uh, stressful event. Um, don't you think that simply those could just be interpreted as energy savings uh, devices? Yes, yeah, I do think that. Um, so one of the costs I mentioned uh, communicable diseases and our de declines in immune function with age, but also our ability to obtain and process energy or our metabolic metabolic systems um, also decline with age. And so energy conservation absolutely is potentially something that we need to take into account. And that could absolutely explain why we might shrink our social networks as we age. Um, and I think that would be really interesting if that were the case. That would still be an adaptive shift, right? We're still managing the costs and benefits of our, of our social relationships um, and shrinking our networks, reducing the complexity of the number of individuals we have to check in on regularly to a smaller number of consistent partners, I think probably saves individuals quite a lot of energy. It also probably saves them a, a bit of risk in terms of where they're going in their environments and who they're encountering when they do that. So it also possibly is reducing their risk of getting injured or encountering a predator, right? So there are all sorts of reasons why we might shrink our networks with age. I think as we continue to establish whether this is a common phenotype in aging group living animals, it happens in humans, it happens in rhesus macaques, there's other age differences that have been documented in other species, but whether that's a true change in age, as change as an individual ages, or just a difference between old and young individuals needs to be established. But if we were to say this is a common phenotype, as animals age, they shrink the size of their social networks, then I think let's start probing why. Is it energetic? Uh, is it hygiene? Is it risk reduction? Is it all of those things? Um, and then also, well, what are the benefits of social relationships as individuals age? Are there just not any? Is it really just a matter of reducing that whole part of your life uh, down to the minimum because you're not really getting much out of it anymore? I think let's ask those questions. Those are really interesting questions. And then your second question was about the hurricane and whether that is also uh, energy reduction. And I think that's a possible, really important interpretation. So if you're tolerating others, you're being less aggressive, you're allowing them to sit next to you, you're not chasing them off. <clears throat> it's a really despotic species. What we would normally see uh, before the hurricane is really high levels of aggression. Individuals aren't just able to walk up to each other without potential consequences, um, particularly a low ranking animal to a high ranking animal. And all of that just got pulled down. And of course, some of that is, <clears throat> well, if I'm not chasing you off, I'm saving energy, which probably helps me in terms of experiencing heat stress. And to chase you off, I probably have to leave my shady spot. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. I'm just going to let you sit next to me. I'm in the shade, you're in the shade. Normally I might not enjoy that, but I'm just going to go with it because the costs of heat stress are here. Uh, and the costs of me sitting next to someone that I don't have a relationship with are, are just not outweighing that. So I think that's absolutely a potential reason why these animals are doing it. They need access to shade and getting rid of the others who are sitting next to them just isn't worth it. Why? Okay. I have uh, one more observation slash question. Um, 
I don't know the network literature well, but I do know that in network theory, uh, especially in ecosystem ecology and in physics, they're looking for general principles of network formation. First of all, I wonder if you're taking a look at that. And secondly, your slide that shows across taxa patterns, dominant patterns in network formation, the dominant pattern being the uh, numerical pattern, how many are in the group, the little icon that has a lot of heads in a circle. There are seven of those and seven, you, the N is seven, and three of those are not group size uh, icons. That's probably significantly different. So I wonder if there's anything to be made of, of the observation, small sample size, but maybe a chi-square powerful test with small sample sizes, anything to be made of the fact that the group size is the dominant pattern and may be a fundamental rule. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. In network science, a lot of the focus is on the fundamental generating processes um, that underlie network structure. Um, and that's true in animal social networks as well. However, we tend to also ask questions in the manner that a lot of my questions have been posed, um, which is instead about, okay, well, here is our network. Here's our estimate of how well connected an individual is, or here's our estimate of how densely connected this network is. Um, how does that relate to other aspects of biology that we might be interested in? So the age of those individuals, for example, or the species of that densely connected network compared to a less densely connected one. So in behavioral ecology, we tend to be interested more in questions uh, about, well, I've measured the social world and now I want to explain it. Um, but we do also sometimes, but less often than the physicists and the computer scientists um, that or sociologists that you've mentioned that are more asking, often asking questions more at the level of network generation. They're interrelated, but they are slightly different. And you would, of course, you of course come at them with different analytical tools. Um, on the issue of group size, absolutely group size, um, whether you're asking questions about network generation or you're just trying to understand the biology of how well connected your network is, group size is, is fundamental because it determines in part all of those metrics. The bigger your group, the greater number of individuals you have uh, potential to form a tie with. The, denser a network can possibly be because there are more individuals, it's simple mass. Um, but that all gets, thankfully, all gets taken into account either at the measure level. So a measure like density, it is really, the equation is how many connections are there relative to the number of connections there might have been. In other words, given your group size, how many connections did you achieve? So it's a, it's a relative measure that accounts for group size. If we're using measures that don't inherently account for group size as a driving factor of that measure, um, then of course we can model it statistically. We can conclude it, and we often do include it as a, say, a random effect in a, in a mixed level model to precisely that, make sure that when we're comparing across our, our social groups, which do vary a lot in how big they are, um, we are fairly certain that what we're detecting is not simply, well, this group is bigger than that one, and so is better connected, and, and da 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 da. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, with respect to the hurricane, uh, given the minimal mortality, the population was fairly stable across that entire period. So it's not that suddenly there were fewer animals, or as you might be suggesting, Clara, Clara, much more animals. So after the hurricane, you know, groups are just bigger, there are just more connections because, well, probabilistically, you're just gonna have more partners in the bigger group. Um, 
we accounted for between group variation and size statistically, but also across the island, the population wasn't uh, denser in one scenario versus another, right? So if you talk to Karsten, of course, you know, population size matters. It can change your whole social structure. In this case, population size hasn't changed. And so we don't, we think we can rule that out as a driver of the change in social structure that we've documented here. Thanks. Thank you, Clara. And we have another question from Luca. Yeah. I think Eduardo was first. Um, oh, yes. Sorry, Eduardo, I skipped you. You want me to go or Luca can go first? I don't mind, it doesn't matter. Just, I think you just opened your mic, so. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eduardo Fernandez Duque from Yale University and I joined late today. So maybe what I, it's a very simple question. So maybe it's already been presented at your talk or you discussed. Have you uh, designed studies manipulating the shade available? Have you mm. explored provisioning them with shade and allowing, I'm thinking of Michael's question and her, what, what we can do given the complexity of our systems. Has that been done? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. We did it on a really small scale, um, I think in 2018 or 2019, uh, a master's student of mine built what is can be described generously as a coffee table. And he put it out on the island, so it's a short little stubby plywood with four legs. And sometimes it had a top, so it was a table and it provided shade. Sometimes it didn't have a top, uh, but we stapled the leaves that they eat on the island around the edge, so it provided food. Because with the decline in trees, also you know, there's a fair provision, but there's a decline in natural food sources. Uh, and sometimes it had nothing, so it was just a frame with four legs. Just to ask, well, what are the monkeys looking for? If we give them these three possible resources, nothing, food, shade, which one are we more likely to find them? Which version of the coffee table are they more likely to associate with? And yeah, on very clear, they wanted the shade. They wanted the top on the coffee table. They sat underneath it and didn't budge. Uh, when we put that out and we moved it all around and, and it was very consistently, no matter what group we were in, um, that they were preferring the shade version. We didn't publish it because I don't know, it's a bit silly, but I think it does sort of show at least a little bit um, that what they were missing from their world wasn't leaves for them to eat. It was in fact the shade. We've asked the NIH to give us money to reforest Cayo or reforest parts of Cayo. And they've said, go away, that's very expensive. <laughs> We don't want to give you that money. I think we're going to keep asking them, see if we can convince them that it's a great idea um, because we would love to do it. We would love to experimentally manipulate their experience. I've also had some wacky ideas of, of providing, you know, in the United States when it's really hot and there are those like little mist machines that are obviously terrible for the environment, but they provide people with a relief from the heat and humidity of some places in the South. We could give the monkeys those, right? There are, there are ways that we could manipulate their uh, thermoregulatory landscape. Um, but some of them are kooky and maybe shouldn't be done. Most of them to be done properly are incredibly expensive. And we've yet to convince anyone to stump up the cash to let us do it. But we'd like to. I, I just want to leave you with uh, my work in Argentina is done in a cattle ranch. So I find myself discussing the landscape with people who care about energy acquisition or losses for money, right? I mean, how well the, the calves grow mm. and, and shade is a big issue. Actually, my PhD advisor used to study competition between cattle breeds for shade Ooh. in Mexico. So there's a, the, the, the applied animal behavior sciences literature, which yeah. I don't know if you're like me, I don't really consult much. No. Uh, it, it's interesting because for them it's money. So so now you really start paying attention to the energy, energetic costs of having shade or not, or any kind of, of ecological 
uh, component, they look at it in a very, very different way. It's, yeah. it's, is, this, is this cow gonna have a baby or not? It matters. Yeah. yeah, oh, cool, thank you. Yeah, I'll check I'll check that out. And if I can't find it, I'll come bug you, see if I can get some references. Thank you, Lordo. Um, and now, yes, Luca. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a brilliant talk. It's really intriguing. Uh, I'm Luca Hahn. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter, and I'm working with uh, Alex Thornton. Um, and I was intrigued, um, given that you've studied a range of different systems, have you found any evidence to suggest that the benefits of social relationships or aspects of social relationships could incur costs in some other contexts? So what I'm thinking about, for example, is that high connectedness is beneficial for information, but on this the same time it might be costly for avoidance of pathogens so i was wondering whether you found any evidence for that and as a follow-up question on that i was wondering whether you think that there might be selection not only on the ability to maintain connections but also on plasticity to adjust connections based on the co context so that you're quite plastic and can adjust your um, social connections quite fast and um, efficiently so yeah i'd be intrigued by you think about that yeah, thank you, Luca. Nice to, I don't think we've met before, just to clarify, I'm oh, in psychology, yeah. which is in Exeter, the city, and Luca is in biosciences, which is in Cornwall, which is a different county, so we're like two hours away, so it's not that we're anti-social at Exeter, but we have a geographical separation. So great to meet you. Um, great to meet you too. <laughs> so your, your first question uh now i've lost my trade of thought your first question was about the costs about the trade-offs yes the trade-offs yeah i mean i think this is all fundamental i focused on the the cheery positive benefits um of social connections but uh, of course it's always a uh, it's always the trade-off right so what costs are you experiencing um and are the benefits of connecting socially, helping you to deal with the challenges you face, and are those benefits bigger than other costs that exist in the system? We always have to think about it um, in this way. And <clears throat> we haven't been looking at uh, pathogen transmission that you mentioned in too much detail. In particular, although Camille Testar, the PhD student, he's been leading our social dynamics in response to the hurricane uh, investigation has teamed up with um, some other behavioral ecologists who are really interested in disease, disease dynamics. And they've effectively run some simulations um, on the network structures that we observed pre and post hurricane. And basically said, okay, well, your social connections have shifted. You are more tolerant. Those networks are much denser. What if now a new disease were, ent were to enter the system? Uh, and the simulated effects are, of course, devastating, right? We have these much more densely connected networks. Individuals are mixing more frequently with a wider number of others. And so the rate of disease spread after the hurricane um, simulated onto our real networks is just astronomically bigger than before. So absolutely, if that kind of secondary shock were to now happen, um, which of course is a realistic scenario, right, natural disasters hit and disease outbreaks follow, we know this to be true, um, then of course these shifts would potentially no longer be adaptive and potentially would be detrimental. And I would, not too sure what I would expect to see, right, because well, what do you do? You're still dealing with heat stress that's resulting in more exposure to disease, I think potentially they would continue to deal with this heat stress, which is more acute, um, and, and the population would potentially get wiped out as a result. Is there selection acting on uh, social flexibility? <clears throat> uh, I think possibly. I think it's a really interesting uh, question that we should be that we should be asking. Um, yeah, how, how I would ask that, I'm not quite sure. Something definitely to, to think through, um, but I can imagine all sorts of scenarios, um, unstable environments. Carson and I were talking about before my talk about um, social thermoregulation and well, why don't you just adapt physiologically, right? You know, like if we've gone through um, 
if we're talking about the rodents and the primates, which socially thermoregulate, they've had you know a very long evolutionary time to work out how to do that uh, through physical adaptations, have thicker fur, have more fat reserves, do whatever. Um, but of course they live in often seasonal dynamic environments. You can't do that. You can't have thicker fur and then because it's minus 20 degrees Celsius in the in the winter and then plus 40 in the summer, you're faced with a heat stress problem again, right? So um, that's not, that might be predictable and seasonal. It might be really dynamic. And so behavior might be a better solution in some cases. And then you would see selection on flexible adjustments in, in behavior in animals that were living in really unpredictable environments if the problem that they're trying to solve socially is heat or cold or both. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Um, I'm going to skip my question and uh, I'll give my spot to Christina and then I'll ask mine afterwards. Thanks very much. Good morning, Lauren. Um, I'm Christina. I'm a postdoc at, in the Bliss Morrow Lab at um, University of California, Davis. And I think you've asked this kind of, or answered this already kind of indirectly, but I wanted to know a bit more about the provisioning that goes on at CAIO. Um, and if you, when you're doing your um, uh, observations, looking at proximity, do you record context for like shade or eating or something like that? Because it, and I think the time of day really reflects this, but I was wondering if maybe because there is so less vegetation available, that that proximity is also coming during the provisioning periods, so that they're more willing to sit next to each other during the provisioning because there is no other food source. And if that's mediating that shade effect, or have you actually looked at, yes, it's shade, they're sitting in the shade, that's the time in which the social relation or the proximity has gone way up. Yeah, um, so conveniently they're fed once a day in the morning straight off all right so, yeah, yeah very convenient right so they're fed yeah. between uh 7 30 and, and sort of nine at the latest and they're done eating by 11 at the latest and so that's exactly the window that we call morning and afternoon actually includes some of the morning so we set it to kind of the feeding window and the afternoon window but actually the temperatures really start to amp up 10 30 11 also as we move towards noon. Um, so yeah, it perfectly lines up. And, and I think it's a really good point because they are provisioned. And um, actually the way that they were being provisioned changed as a result of Maria because all the research infrastructure was wiped out. They used to be fed in a single location at a feeder, right? It's actually a hog feeder. They put yeah. monkey chow in it, right? They would lift up the little lids and they would, <clears throat> they would eat away and they were a single location there were three locations. So groups were competing for access to that location. And then within groups, it was very higher, hierarchically predicted who was accessing food first. And blah, blah, blah. But all of those things got destroyed by Maria. And so then what was happening was chow was just being you know, thrown on the ground in little piles. So a bit more of a scattered food approach. And so there you would absolutely predict proximity would go up because contest competition has gone down food is scattered around, you probably would be able to find somebody who's willing to tolerate you sitting near the pile of chow that they're near. Um, so we think the morning data are reflecting this change, mm. uh, but the afternoon data when they're not eating are reflecting the change that's, that's due to shade and the shift in thermoregulatory landscape. Uh, and the fact that the survival result is really borne out in that afternoon, that they're spending more time, even more time in proximity in the afternoon, and the survival result is really borne out by that afternoon data. Um, we think, yeah, addresses that. We're, we're now changing back the food experimentally mm -hmm. and seeing what that does to their social relationships, and we'll put it back to the other way around. So we're actually messing with the food competition and whether it's heavily contested or more of a kind of scramble competition kind of approach and seeing if that changes the social relationships again. And if it's competition, are you then really honing in on certain high quality partners? Uh, and when it's scramble, are you going back to sort of the more laissez-faire fit next to anyone who's available kind of kind of attitude? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd be curious if the if the change in proximity tolerance would generalize to the feeding 
context or if it maintains it's just the shade I'm, I can sh- I'll share my shade yeah. but I won't share my access to food yeah I won't share my monkey chow um yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we're we're gonna we're gonna dig into it, but yeah, we're we're doing it over. Uh, we don't expect these shifts to be all that instantaneous. So we've we put the food back to single feeders, monopolizable feeders, uh, and we're gonna let that sit for the next year, and then we'll shift it back to the scramble. So talk to me in a couple of years. I'll be able to tell you a bit more. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'll ask my question very quick. Uh, it goes back to the aging and the shrinking networks. And I was wondering if you have looked at life expect- expectancy versus shrinking networks. So if, even if you're old, I mean, you get it old, right? But everyone has sort of a different life expectancy based on your survival throughout your lifetime. Um, so so I was wondering, maybe you have a fewer life expectancy compared to other, then your network will shrink either at a faster mm. rate or probably more than if your life expectancy was <clears throat> greater. All right. So you're sort of saying are you, you're a lower quality individual. You shrink your network faster. Than if yeah, you're I don't know what the relationship individual. will be like. Like, yeah. I mean, my, be- my first guess is lower will be but yeah uh, yeah that's a good question because you could also possibly hypothesize well you're a low quality individual you might really struggle to access things in your environment that you need and, and you really need social support more than a high quality individual would so you might be inclined to maintain the size of your network but probably what's happening kind of related to what Clara was saying is that the lower quality individuals just really struggle to, with everything, getting energy, um, avoiding disease, coping with disease once they've got it. And so probably they're just struggling across the board. And I would expect their, yeah, how they access social support and the consequences of social support, support just be in step with sort of who they are already. Yeah, I can kind of see it going either way, but I kind of suspect the depressing one is what's probably true. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think I haven't seen that before, like anything related to life expectancy and yeah, literature, but I don't remember anything along those lines. Um, No, because typically, because your social life changes, typically the way that we set up these survival models is is time varying right so Mm -hmm. you know what social social support have you got in this time window and do you live to the end of it and then we just repeat that within the individual which also kind of like controls for that confound of some individuals being higher quality than others because they might just simply be high quality so live longer and have more social relationships but those two things aren't actually causally linked to each other um by asking within individuals so here's how connected you were in time point x did you live to the end of it time point y did you live to the end of it by doing that we, we're sort of you know it's internally consistent i'm the same quality throughout that period so what's the only thing that should be varying is my access to social support so yeah we said i think that that's really important if you didn't set up your models in that time varying way then you would have to account for quality being both a determinant of lifespan and potentially a determinant of social relationships in a way that wasn't causally closed triangle right and that's just hard to do it'll be hard yeah well i mean you could do it (laughs) sorry maybe talk to the demographers and see yeah 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 uh, i mean if that would matter in the first place in the first place like if that i mean just by con- conceptually, those are two different things, right? Yeah. But um, demographically modeling that, will that yeah. make any difference um, in how we approach that and, and our social environment? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I know that demographers would tell you to put a term in there for quality, like come up with some as best you can 
measure of quality and stick that into your model. That's what they would say to do to account for that. Um, in any like senescence model, that's what they would tell you to do. We just don't often have a very good one that's not like totally circular with the rest of the questions that we're asking. So it's really tricky. It is really tricky. And weirdly within individual data is the solution out of that problem. But having within individual data is also so rare and hard to get. Studying aging is hard, but I'm gonna say. Like, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> well, thank you. And I think we have another question from Angel. Yes, hi, I'm Angel. Thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, you mentioned having close kin as um, social bonds. Um, and I was wondering if there's a difference in terms of the benefits between having kin um, and close non-kin individuals as uh, social bonds. Yeah. And identity plays less of a factor. Right. Yeah, thanks, Angel, for that question. Um, I mean, absolutely, if you just look at sort of the, the mass of it, right? So what evolutionary benefits am I able to get out of a partner who I'm cooperating with, who I'm related to versus I'm not related to, somebody I'm related to does well, then my genes through them are going to be uh, more common in future generations. And you know, then you've won you know, the evolutionary fitness lottery, right? So, and that might, therefore impact the decisions that you're making who should i interact with how how much should i invest in a related individual versus an unrelated individual um so it absolutely plays a really big role do we know much about that role beyond sort of that theoretical mathematical kind of hamiltonian truth that i just dropped on you no not really um so people are starting to explore uh in humans, um, so in colleagues in anthropology are looking at this and outside of it. Um, so in, I have a PhD student and had a master's student who were looking at exactly, who have been looking at exactly, well, how common is it to live with a mixture of rel relatives and, and non-relatives? Once you do that, then what are you doing with those relatives? Um, so we've shown in the rhesus macaques, for example, as I said, in my talk, the females live with really close relatives who are, form these matrilines lines that are hierarchically structured, but they also live with completely unrelated females. So a whole other matrilline line that they're not related to. And this is kind of how macaques structure their societies. It's quite normal for macaques and a lot of other primates to be, groups to be structured in this way. And we've known for a really long time that uh, female primates who live in those systems preferentially interact with their close relatives. They groom them more, they form coalitions with them more, and they sit next to them more. They, th those are their preferred partners if you just look at how often are you interacting with others. Um, but we wanted to know, well, what are they doing with those non-relatives? Are they not forming relationships with them at all? Are they sometimes forming relationships with them? And if so, are they only doing it when they don't have any kin available? So it's sort of a best of a bad situation. Uh, I need somebody. I'm not going to get inclusive fitness off of you, but I just need somebody. So you're it. Um, and what Julie, the master student, found was that um, actually it's really common that females form really close relationships with non-relatives. Uh, so if you break it down in terms of on average, a female or cat will have about 10, eight to 10 social partners. Of those, there are three that she interacts with uh, quite a bit more than the others. She has some weak relationships. She has some strong relationships. Of her three strong partners, strongest partners, we thought, well, those are always going to be kin. And the rest of the mix, you know, the rest of those eight, 10 individuals are going to be non-kin. And that's not true at all. So almost always one of those top three individuals was uh, is a non-relative in our system. Uh, and sometimes two of your closest partners you interact with the most um, are non-kin. And it's partly predicted by how many kin you've got available, but not entirely predicted by it. So these are females who have kin available that they could be interacting with, but their closest partners aren't relatives to them. Just strange. Um, those relationships are more volatile, right? So they, they only kind of last a year or so, and then they disappear. They might re reappear later in our data set. 
or you might just replace them with a new non-relative who's suddenly now your you know, top, your number two partner compared to the kin relationships that are more steady and stable. Um, but yeah, why they're doing this? What's the function of, not, of non-kin relationships? Does it get you something different from kin relationships? We assume it has to be better than a kin relationship because you have to get really high direct fitness benefits to outweigh the inclusive fitness you're going to get from interacting with a kin. So we assume whatever they're getting, it's the bigger payout than what they're getting from their relatives. But what that is, do those relationships correlate with things like survival or reproductive output are all questions that are outstanding and things that we'd like to ask next in our system. Um, and I think just this issue of, of kinship, what are you getting out of your kin partners? What are you getting out of non-kin individuals who you live with? Um, is a direction that a lot of people are, are moving. So I'm pretty sure some interesting results are gonna start coming out of not just behavioral ecology groups, but also anthropology and potentially also sociology researchers are going to start to show why are we interacting with non-kin? Is it different from our interactions with kin? Um, and yeah, so how? Thank you so much. Thank you, Angel. And I think we have, we don't have more questions. So I'm just going to stop the live stream. Uh, not before saying thank you again, Lauren, for your great talk and this awesome discussion. And uh, everyone, for being here in our last seminar of the series. And I invite you all to stay in touch and keep an eye on our social media uh, for the schedule for the next um, series in the fall. Um, and so I hope you see you around.